the meeting this evening. It's good to see you. We're going to commence with the singing of hymn number 570. It's found on page 406, hymn 570. I firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, you who unto Jesus for refuge have fled. And the Lord help us to think upon these words and to sing them with our hearts unto the Lord. We'll stand to sing after the musical introduction, please. All standing, please. I firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, you who want to Jesus for Gracious God, and our loving, eternal, heavenly Father, Thou art the one who inhabits eternity, Thou art the one who is the high and the lofty one, Thou art the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art the one, Father, who created this world through Thy beloved Son. And I thank Thee, Father, that creating us, everything that Thou didst do was good. Let us look at what thy hands had made. 
and that is declared it was very good. And yet, Father, we have taken thy goodness, which is abundant, and, Father, we have rebelled against thee. And yet, Lord, in love, even before the foundations of this world, now thou didst commit and make a covenant to send thy beloved Son to pay the debt for sinners, even for us as thy children. Father, thy love, thy grace, we cannot fully comprehend it. But for what we can understand, we give thee thanks. And I pray this evening thou wouldst help us to understand it more. All that thou hast given to us in Jesus Christ, and what thy will for us is, for Father, in sending thy beloved Son and him giving his all, it is thy desire that we love him, and that we love thee, and that we love God, the Holy Spirit, with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Father, I pray that tonight as we look at thy living word, that it would indeed be just that, a living word. Come and speak to us that word in season that needs to be spoken. We thank thee for thy blessing last Tuesday evening. Thy presence. And each one who was spoken to through thy word. I thank thee for speaking to my heart. I pray, Father, that we would not forget thy word. But he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And Father, I pray that that would be the case this evening. That we would hear the very Spirit of Christ speaking to us. Let it be a word in season, Lord. Strengthen us, encourage us. Lead us on with thyself. Make us to be what thou dost want us to be. For thou art worthy of all the glory and of all the honor. And the merits of Christ, who's purchased every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, we pray for thy blessing. For each one that's here and for each one that's listening online, who would love to be here but are unable to, Lord, be with them, touch them in their body, those that need to be touched. We thank thee for each one. And Father, I pray that I would just make tonight to be one that will truly last for eternity, that will impact eternity through thy word, which is spoken, and Father, through our prayers that are made then for thy glory and thy kingdom. Come and answer prayer in the merits of Christ, and for his glory we plead it. Amen. Amen. So you turn with me, please, the living word of God to Revelation and the chapter 2. As we continue our series looking at the seven churches, we come to the second church to whom Jesus Christ specifically addresses, and of course, these Addresses were not just for that individual church, but all the churches were to read of it and to benefit from it, whether it be words of encouragement or whether it be words of chastisement. But Revelation in the chapter 2, and we'll commence reading at verse 8, Jesus Christ is the speaker. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Amen. We'll end our reading there at verse 11. One of the most intense competitions in the world of endurance is the Ironman Triathlon Race. It is undertaken by over 70,000 people each year from 50 different countries. This particular competition consists of a 2.4-mile swim, a 112-mile bicycle ride, and then a marathon run of 26.22 miles. All of this must be completed within 17 hours. I don't know if any of you fancy taking up this year later on. But it's not uncommon for an athlete 
to burn the equivalent of four days' worth of food during that single race and lose around five and a half pounds of weight. The Ironman Triathlon is a great test of endurance where a person's body is put through the extreme. And as you can appreciate, not everyone who enters the race finishes the race. This evening, you and I are going to look at the church in Smyrna, a church which is put under intense testing. Now, if I could sum up the church of Smyrna and Christ's message to it, it would be like this, tested and triumphant. Tested and triumphant. There has be a number of things regarding the Lord and this church in Smyrna. First of all, Christ cares for the church in Smyrna. In verse 9, Jesus Christ says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Just think about those words, I know. There are different words that are translated in the Greek, which are translated as Engl in the English as I know. This particular word is the Greek verb "ido." You may hear me refer to it from time to time in the days to come. This word is often translated in the New Testament, not as I know, but actually as I see. In fact, it's one of the most intimate, close, and intense verbs in the Greek that can be translated as I see. Jesus Christ, he is really saying, I see. I know thy works, I know thy tribulation, I know thy poverty. I see it. I see it closely. See, men and women, Jesus Christ does not neglect or ignore the church in Smyrna, or indeed any of the other six churches. Jesus Christ doesn't even give the church in Smyrna a passing glance. No, Jesus Christ looks intensely upon this church. He looks upon their works and their activities. He looks upon their lives and their situation. He looks upon their heart and their struggles. In Psalm 34, verse 15, we read, The eyes of the Lord are, in the present tense, are upon the righteous. And his ears are open unto their cry. There is never a moment, dear child of God, when Christ's eyes are not upon you and upon his people. Not a moment. There's never a moment when Christ's ears are not open to our cry. Put simply, there's never a moment when Jesus Christ does not care for us. Notice with me two headings underneath this reality that Christ cares. Christ knows and cares about the persecution of the church in Smyrna. Jesus Christ says in verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation. The word for tribulation literally means to press together. It's the idea of squeezing. In fact, in the ancient Greek culture, it was used in a variety of ways. It was used to refer to that which was placed in a vice. And of course, as the screws were tightened, then the squeeze would come on. It was also used to refer to a victim who was crushed and their life's blood would drain from them. And even in Scripture itself, in John 16, 21, the term is translated as anguish, where it's referring to a mother as she pushes her baby out in childbirth. It's the idea of squeezing. Without doubt, the church in Smyrna was undergoing some severe and very painful persecution. They were being squeezed, placed, as it were, in a vice. There's two examples of this persecution found in this small portion. There was persecution from those who claimed to be religious. In verse 9, Christ says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. And are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Blasphemy here refers to slander, to defame somebody. It's translated in Ephesians 4.31 as evil speaking, or indeed in Jude 1 verse 9 as one who reels against another. And if you look out throughout history, you will read about how while Smyrna had a great population of Jews in the first century, yet uh, from what we see here, not all those who were Jews not all those who claimed to be the people of God were indeed the people of God. Those who claimed to be the people of God actually spoke against the Christian church. 
they hated the church. They spread lies about the church. Some of the slanders that would have been made in the first century were that whenever the, the Christian church celebrated the Lord's Supper, there were those who would have said that they actually ate real blood and bodies of humans, and they were cannibals. They would slander the church. In the first century, some of the slanderous remarks that were made regarding the church was that whenever people referred to each other in the Christian church as brothers and sisters, that they were accused of incestuous relationships. And here we find the Jews, those who profess to be the people of God, there they're committing slander, defamation. They were speaking evil, railing against the Christian church there in Smyrna. Instead of being the true followers of God, they were nothing of the sort. They were indeed, in fact, the followers of Satan. You see, there was persecution from those who claimed to be religious, but there was also persecution from another group, and simply from those who were secular. Because in the middle of verse 10, Jesus Christ will speak about how there would be those who would be cast into prison, cast into the government's prison, the local town, or indeed the local city's prison. You see, there was attack and persecution from those who claimed to be religious, but also those who were secular. While Ephesus last week was renowned for its worship of the false goddess Diana, Smyrna here is a city which was renowned for its worship of Caesar. You see, whenever the Roman emperor brought about the Pax Romana, that is, a peace throughout the empire, many people rejoiced in that because instead of there being civil wars and fighting within the empire, now people could begin just to focus on living and trading not merely within their own little community, but actually with other cities and other towns, and even further afield. And many people rejoiced in the Pax Romana, in this peace brought throughout the empire, ordered by Caesar. And in thankfulness, many towns and many cities actually began to, in thankfulness, show devotion to the emperor. A devotion that sadly turned into worship of the emperor. Smyrna was one that was particularly keen in its worship of the emperor. And as a result, its city's officials would make it compulsory that every single person, every man, every woman within Smyrna must publicly burn incense upon the altar to Caesar once a year. If you did it, you were given a certificate, and that was you until the next year. But if you didn't, if you didn't worship the emperor, if you didn't show your allegiance to the emperor, one whom they believe to be a deity and whose favor must be upon that city. Well, if you didn't appease the emperor, then you must be punished severely. And you look, out, you look at history and you will find that there would be a man at the age of 92 who chose death rather than bow to Caesar in Smyrna. You read of a 15-year-old boy who refused to worship the emperor in Smyrna and he was tortured. You'll read about a young teenager, a young female thrown in a net to a wild beast simply because she would not worship Caesar by burning incense once in the year. One of the most famous martyrdoms in Smyrna was that of Polycarp. He was a disciple of the Apostle John, and he was a minister in Smyrna. He was aged in his 90s, and he was summoned before the Roman authorities for not burning incense to Caesar and confessing Caesar as a deity. And Polycarp answered, 86 years have I served Jesus. He has been faithful to me. How can I be faithless to him and blaspheme his name? As the wood was gathered to burn Polycarp alive, even there an elderly man, Polycarp was heard praying as the flames arose, Lord, I thank thee that thou hast thought me worthy of this hour. And he bowed his head and he said, Amen. So let it be. Jesus Christ is the one who said, I know thy tribulation. I see it. There's a number of lessons there for you and I this evening. One lesson is, indeed, the very words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. And there we read, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In Acts 14, 22, the we read, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, some Christians have the thought in their mind, well, if I am holy and if I am good, then I will be liked by people. 
do you think about Joseph in the Old Testament? He was holy and he was good, but he was hated. Do you think about Jeremiah? He was holy and he was good, but he was hated by the townspeople. He was hated by the king. He was hated by his own family. He was hated by his neighbors. Do you think about Jesus Christ, the holiest person who ever lived? Perfectly holy. And yet he was hated, hunted, and persecuted for his holiness. Men and women, did you know that whenever 318 church leaders met at the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century, less than 4% of those early church, church leaders, less than 4% had escaped the losing of a hand, an eye, or some other bodily part for their faith in Jesus Christ. 306 out of the 318 had been persecuted for Jesus Christ. Without doubt, the early church was tested. But as I've mentioned, the early church here in Smyrna was triumphant. Because while they would be called to give up many things for the Lord, they gave those things up. If it was an eye, if it was a hand, if it was even their life, they would give it up. They were faithful to the Lord. Throughout the world this evening, in places like North Korea, Somalia, Libya, believers are being given an ultimatum. Christ, or lose your home. Christ, or lose your job. Christ, or lose your family. Christ, or lose your life. We need to pray for such people. But tonight, you and I may not be under such in persecution. However, let me ask you, as I ask myself, if you and I knew that going to church this incoming Lord's Day would result in us losing our home, would we still go to worship the Lord? If you and I knew that praying in our home this Friday would result in us losing our job, would we still pray? If you and I knew that speaking to someone about the Lord would result in us being arrested, tortured, and put through the horrific process of crucifixion, would we still do it? Perhaps there is someone who is being persecuted this evening for their faith. Maybe it's in their family. Maybe it's in their home. Maybe it's in where, or indeed among those whom you study or work. Well, let me encourage you with this first truth tonight, that Jesus Christ cares. He cared about the church in Smyrna, and he cares about you. You're not alone. Not only are there other believers around the world suffering along with you, but Jesus Christ himself is the one who says to you this evening, I know thy tribulation. I know thy anguish. I know thy struggle. I see you, as it were, being placed in the vice and it tightening upon you. I see thy suffering. And even more than that, I know all about it. Because I was the one who suffered before you. Suffering a way more than anybody can ever comprehend. And I've promised to be to you all that you need in your strength, in your courage, and in your provision as you look to me forward. If you turn me, please, the book of Hebrews in the chapter 4. The book of Hebrews in the chapter 4. In the verse 14, we read that we have a high priest in the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And as a result, we need to hold fast our profession. And we're encouraged to hold fast. It is not to give up our profession. In the end of verse 15, we read that this high priest, Jesus Christ, was touched with a feeling of our infirmities. He is in all points tempted. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And then verse 16, we're told, Therefore, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The hymn writer asked, Does Jesus care when my heart is pained? Too deeply for mirth or song, as the burdens press, and the cares distress, and the day grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. You see, one lesson from this church in Smyrna is that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution in one form or another. 
Another lesson is that persecution will come from a variety of places. The church in Smyrna suffered persecution from those who professed to be in the world and those who professed to be in the church. And so it was with the apostle Paul. He was hated and mistreated by the authorities in Philippi when they arrested him and threw him into prison in Acts 16. But the apostle Paul was also hated and mistreated by those whom he says appeared as, quote, angels of light in 2 Corinthians 11. And so the reminder for you and I this evening is not to get deterred, not to get distracted, not to get discouraged regarding the work that we have to do for the Lord. After all, Jesus Christ knows those who are truly His. He knows those who are the temple of God, with God dwelling in them. And He also knows those who are the synagogue of Satan, with Satan dwelling in them. Jesus Christ is the one who knows. And one other lesson is that we must focus on pleasing God and not people. It is important to have a good testimony and a good reputation before men. And because of this, we often apply these truths to our lives by not wanting to be too zealous or too bold or too faithful when it comes to our appearance before others. We don't want to make too strong a stand for truth. We don't want to make too clear a witness for Christ. Whenever it comes to the workplace or comes to our neighbors, we just want to do just enough to do something while at the same time just fly under the radar and try not to be noticed. Men and women, let us never forget that the definition of a good testimony and a good reputation is nothing less than putting God first, of pleasing God, serving God, and honoring God, whether it pleases men or not. That is a good testimony. It was the Apostle Paul who said in Galatians 1.10, If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Those in Smyrna, their focus and their concern was simply being faithful to God regardless of the consequences. See, Jesus Christ knows and cares about the persecution of the church in Smyrna, but notice with me then the second heading, Jesus Christ knows and cares about the poverty of the church in Smyrna. Jesus Christ said in Revelation 2 verse 9, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. For those who were here in the Lord's Day evening, whenever we dealt with the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, I mentioned you that occasion that there are different Greek terms for poverty. There is one Greek term which refers to having little money, but enough to make a living, enough just to scrape by on. But then there is another word for poverty, which is to have absolutely nothing. To be like Lazarus in Luke's gospel, where Lazarus had nothing. He had no family to come and bind up his wounds. The dogs had to come. He had no money. He had no health to have a job to get the money. He had no home. He had nothing. Well, it's that term that's used here. If you and I were to see a postcard photo of Smyrna from the first century, we would wonder how that could be. Because, you see, the coinage that was used in Smyrna, it had stamped on that coinage this phrase, Smyrna was, quote, first in Asia in beauty and science. In fact, Smyrna was known in the ancient world as the crown and flower of Asia. Men and women, Smyrna was a very wealthy city. While other cities would develop gradually and in time in a bit of a hickledy-pickledy way, streets here, streets there, in all different shapes, Smyrna was planned from the very beginning. It had well-planned, large, broad streets. Its roads were lined with beautiful trees. It was the most beautiful city. It even had a golden street upon which was laid a very expensive and large temple to Zeus. Smyrna did not struggle economically. And so you and I could wonder, well, how could the Christian church be those that have nothing? How could they be those who are absolutely pure? The answer is very simple, actually, because with Smyrna, loving the worship of Caesar and loving the worship of false gods and goddesses like Zeus and Aphrodite, If you were to have a job in Smyrna, you had to belong to a guild, the equivalent of a modern-day trade union. And every guild had their own false god or own false goddess to worship. And if you didn't worship one of those great deities, you could not get into a guild. If you couldn't get into a guild, you couldn't get a job. If you couldn't get a job, then you couldn't make money. 
You think, well, I could just get, you know, I could cut down a tree and do some carving and sell that. Well, nobody would buy from you if you weren't part of a guild. That's why they were poor. That's why they had absolutely nothing. Because the church in Smyrna wouldn't compromise with worshipping a false god, even if it was going to help their career, even if it was simply just to get a job. They wouldn't compromise. Jesus Christ, the one who says to them, I know thy poverty. I see it. And I care about it. And that leads us to the second point this evening. Christ not only cares about the church in Smyrna, but Jesus Christ consoles the church in Smyrna. Jesus Christ, seeing the persecution and poverty of this church, Christ consoles them. Because in verse 9 of chapter 2, he says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but... Thou art rich. Although this church was poor financially and outwardly, the church was rich spiritually. Jesus Christ assured this church that it had riches laid up in heaven where neither moth nor rust would corrupt those riches. It was a rich church. You see, men and women, this church looked like nothing to those around it. But this church was something in the eyes of Jesus Christ. If you compare Smyrna to the church we looked at last week in Ephesus, Ephesus looked great. It was a big church. Many people had been converted, and it was busy for the Lord in many activities. It was orthodox, loving truth and hearing error. It was separated, casting out and staying away from false teaching. And yet Jesus Christ told Ephesus, the church which looked so good, that they were on the verge of being removed by Christ himself. Smyrna, on the other hand, it looked like nothing in the eyes of this world. No doubt it was orthodox, separated unto the Lord and busy for the Lord. But Christ does say, I know thy works. Yet this church would have been small in the Lord's day. Many of his members being in prison cells. Even those who were able to meet, they would have met in basic surroundings. They would have had no nice church building to meet in. In fact, the believers themselves in Smyrna would have looked like nothing because they had nothing. They had no money. They wouldn't have had nice clothing or nice clothes, and they would have been indeed the scar of society. But none of this mattered. What was important to Christ was not their outward appearance, but their heart. Jesus Christ says, I know thy poverty, but, but thou art rich. You see, dear children of God, this evening I ask myself this question as I ask you. Are you and I ever tempted to make judgments? simply based on the outward. This is a temptation for even the most godly of people. For those who were here for the 9 a.m. prayer meeting on Lord's Day morning, you heard me speak about Samuel, a godly prophet, a godly leader. And yet the Lord had to tell him off for looking at the outward appearance whenever it came to anointing the next king of Israel after Saul. God had to remind Samuel not to be looking in the outward appearance only. I wonder, do you and I judge people simply by their outward appearance? Do we judge a person's spirituality by how fancy their clothes are, or by how good their education is? Do we judge a person's closeness to God by how nice their home is, or how well off their bank balance is? See, Jesus Christ said of a man in the New Testament, a man who did no miracles, a man who was not an apostle, a man who didn't preach in a fancy building, a man who wore the most basic of clothing, a man whose food was very basic, and whose service was hated and slandered by the religious authorities, Jesus Christ said of this man, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. In fact, Jesus Christ said of this man in John 5, 35, he was a burning and a shining light. The church in Smyrna had nothing. But Jesus Christ consoles the church and says, But thou art rich. And let this be an encouragement to you and I this evening that it is possible for us to delight Christ because this church was a delight to Christ. The term Smyrna comes from the term myrrh in the Greek. And the reason this city is called after myrrh was simply because the city was famous throughout the ancient world for its production of myrrh. That herb that whenever it's taken from a tree and it's crushed, it gives off a beautiful scent. You see, men and women, the church at Smyrna being beaten, being bruised, 
being put in that vice and crushed with all of its persecution and with all of its poverty. It was a delight to Christ. Unlike Ephesus, which needed to be rebuked for leaving its first love, Smyrna needs no rebuke. Smyrna still loves Christ. Smyrna is still humble, unlike Ephesus. The believers there in Smyrna see themselves as nothing. Unlike Ephesus, the hearts of the believers in Smyrna are thankful that Christ would ever love them. Having no hope of getting much in this world, the believers in Smyrna, they weren't distracted with the things of this world. Instead, their focus was simply just to strive after God and to enjoy Him because they could get Him. And while the world hated them and not want, did not want them, the believers in Smyrna could have each other and they could love one another. Minimum, these believers in Smyrna very much had Christ as their first love, and as a result, they were a delight to Christ, and they were rich in Christ. In fact, one could even say that the persecution and poverty facilitated the delight that they were in Christ. It was because that they were persecuted that they would realize more and more how dependent they were in Christ. It was because they were persecuted that they would need to look more and more to Christ. It was because they were persecuted they would appreciate more and more than they ever had that Christ was indeed their all in all. They didn't need the things of this world. And the reality is this evening that difficulty and trials can often produce the greatest fruit in the life of a believer. If you turn to me, please, again to Revelation 2, this time verse 10. Christ goes on to say to the church in Smyrna, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. For what purpose? Why would the Lord permit these delightful believers to be cast into prison. We're told there that for this purpose, that ye may be tried. Why was all this persecution happening? Why was all this poverty happening? Why was the Lord permitting the persecution and poverty? It was so that the church would be tried, that it would be tested, indeed, as that word is sometimes translated in the New Testament. It was Job who said in Job 23.10 regarding the Lord, he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. While Satan and the world persecutes the believer, the Lord permits it in order to purify the believer. You and I will eventually, in the will of the Lord, come to the church in Laodicea. The church in Laodicea, they were so blessed with outward things that they said within themselves, we have need of nothing. And they weren't a church that prayed. Smyrn, on the other hand, they realized they needed Christ for everything. They needed Christ continually. They needed Christ even to get bread to survive from day to day. They needed Christ. Seeing their need of Christ, more than they ever had because of their persecution and their poverty. Christ was ever their first love. Men and women, mountaintop experiences can be fruitful, but the reality of life is that valleys tend to be more fruitful than mountaintops. And in light of that truth, I wonder if you and I are willing to pray this evening, Lord, whatever is going to make me more fruitful, more like Christ in my walk with you, just let it be. If it's going to be the mountain top, Lord, let it be. If it's going to be a valley, Lord, just let it be. Because my aim in this life is to see you as glorious and to love you as glorious and to become more like you. Are you and I willing also this evening to see that any difficulties we do experience from the providence of the Lord, that they're not sent by the Lord to destroy us but to develop us? God is the one who will often use trials and difficulties to draw us ever closer to him. Christ consoles the church in Smyrna. They were poor financially, but Christ says, you are rich. You are rich. The story is told of a wealthy believer in America who was known for generously giving away large amounts of money. During the years of the Great Economic Depression, when the stock market in America just crashed, this wealthy man was left penniless. The person came to him and said, are you not now sorry that you gave away so much of your money? 
The man replied, of course not. What I gave away is all the money I have left. Because that man realized that his true worth and his true wealth was actually only calculated by taking away all that death would take away from him. Indeed, what death would not take away from him was what was reserved in heaven already for him. We can't take our money with us, but we can send, as it were, what we have before us by doing a work for the Lord. Christ cares for the church in Smyrna. He consoles the church in Smyrna. But notice with me briefly, thirdly, Christ counsels the church in Smyrna. What was Christ's counsel to this church that was going through such difficulty and trials? Well, Christ's counsel was twofold. Look me there at verses 9 and 10. Christ says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may try, be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thy faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Christ's counsel to the believers in Smyrna is twofold. It's first of all, be fearless. Christ says, beginning of verse 10, fear none of those things. You, some of you are going to be in prison. Some of you will actually even be killed. You will lose the familiarity of your surroundings whenever you're put in prison. You'll lose the freedom of being able to walk around in the open air. You'll lose the smell of freshly baked bread in the streets. You'll lose the closeness of being with family and friends. You'll lose the opportunity of fellowship with believers in the Lord's day to worship. You'll lose any material possessions that you do have, no matter how small they are. You will lose these things. But fear not the form of your suffering. And fear not the length of your suffering. Because Christ said, And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Now there is discussion among commentators what is meant by Christ when he says the tribulation will last ten days. But there's two things that are clear. Ten is a relatively small number in Scripture compared to other numbers. Forty and forty-two and indeed a thousand that are even mentioned in Revelation. Ten is a relatively small number and also ten is a limited number. Ten is not everlasting and ten is not eternal. And so there's two lessons here, clearly. The believers are not to be fearful of the form of their suffering because it was going to be limited in its duration. One day their suffering would end. Whether it was in time or indeed in eternity, their persecution was not everlasting. It would come to an end. And the believers are not to be fearful because of the form of their suffering because it was going to be short in comparison to eternity. The Apostle Paul was one who suffered abundantly for Christ. He was whipped five times. He was imprisoned multiple times. He was robbed. He was stoned. He was left for dead in the sea multiple times. He was left for dead at the side of the road multiple times. Many times the Apostle Paul was without food, without water, and without company. He was without clothing and without warmth. He even had, at one occasion, 40 assassinators hunting him to kill him. And yet Paul says these Profound words in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he says, For our light affliction, a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The apostle Paul saw his suffering as light. All of that combined together, being whipped five times, being in prison, being robbed and stoned and left for dead, being without food and without water, and without company, without clothing, without warmth, and having 40 people wanting to kill you at one time. He said it's light compared to the eternal reward of being with Christ. You see, those in Smyrna were counseled to be fearless, to fear not their suffering, but also to be faithful. At the end of verse 10, Christ says, Be thou faithful. Be thou faithful unto death. Christ's desire for these believers was that they would be fearless. Having faith that their suffering and trials were only going to last for a short time. And it would be nothing compared to the eternal reward that they would have in glory. But also they would be faithful. Faithful to God, no matter the cost. Faithful to God, no matter how long their suffering was or was not. They would just be faithful. Let me tell you a brief story. A few years ago, whenever I was uh, teaching 
the Greek in the college, I got chatting with, with one of the students, and we were talking about two ministers that had retired around the same time. One minister is very well known in her domination. He would take a lot of gospel missions and be very well known. We would have seen a lot of people converted to Christ. There was another minister who retired about the same time, and he's not very well known. In fact, he was very rarely ever asked to preach around different churches. He was, however, a great expositor of God's word to the faithful small congregation that came to hear him preach week by week. And we began talking about these two different individuals that had retired and began to wonder, what is true success? And we realized true success is not how much fruit you have in terms of conversions. Because one day the apostle Peter got up and he preached, filled with the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people converted. A few chapters later we read about Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost. He gets up and preaches and he gets killed. So true success is not finding the fruit that you have in terms of conversions. The true success is not found in how fervent you are. One man was a very loud preacher, the other man was a very quiet preacher. True success is not found in how many feelings you enjoy. We read in the New Testament of a rich man who felt that they were, indeed rich men, who felt they were giving much to the temple of God's work. But one poor widow felt that she was giving nothing to the temple of God's work with two mites. But Christ says that that little lady actually gave more than everybody else. It's not about how you feel. True success is not how many talents you have. Peter was a fisherman, along with James and John, but Gamaliel was a talented educator and philosopher. But one knew what it was to walk closer to God, and the other didn't even know God. What is true success? True success is faithfulness. It's likeness to Christ. It's fullness of the Spirit of God. It's love for God, joy in God, peace in God. It's being long-suffering, gentle, and good to your fellow man, showing them Christ by those virtues. It's being trustworthy, meek, and temperate in your walk with God. That's faithfulness. That's true success. Jesus Christ said the two servants both had different degrees of fruit. But Christ said to them both in Matthew 25, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful. Is that your prayer tonight? Lord, just make me faithful. Is that what you will strive to be tonight and tomorrow, Lord? Just, I want to be faithful. Let me just conclude. Christ comforts the church in Smyrna. How did Christ introduce himself to this church? Verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. This church that was struggling, being persecuted, this church which was going to be sent to death, many of them within it, Christ wants them to remember four things about him. I just mentioned them. That Christ the first, he is the one who created this world and is in charge of it. Before him was nothing formed. He is the first. He also wants to remember that he is the last. He is the one who will not merely exist at the end of time, but he will have the last word at the end of time. He will be victorious. He is the one who was dead. The one who loved his people and died to pay the full debt for their sins at Calvary. And he is the one who is alive today. The one who rose from the dead and is not only giving his people life, but the one who will raise his people to life at the end of time to enjoy eternity with him. And do you see the link here? While the devil and the world were going to be killing many of these believers in Smyrna, in persecution, yet he who was dead and is now alive will raise these believers up again. You see the link there? While the devil and the world may seem to be winning in the city of Smyrna with their persecution, and while those who were ungodly had an abundance of wealth in Smyrna, while the godly were poor and had basically nothing, and had no inf- very little influence as they saw it, yet Christ, the one who is the first and the last, he owns all things. And the Lord was working all things together to achieve his ultimate end of saving every single last one of his people. Jesus Christ wanted his people to remember that he is the first and the last, the one who was dead, the one who is alive, that he is the creator, that he is the victor who will bring all things to a glorious end for his people, that he is the one who is the savior who loves us and he died for us, but he is the one who is the conqueror, the one who will raise up with him, who are believers, us with him for all eternity. And so men and women, just be encouraged. While you may suffer persecution, Jesus Christ, the one who's overcome this world. 
And Jesus Christ says in verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. In the verse 10, he says, I will give thee a crown of life. See, those that believe in Christ are those who will overcome the world because Christ is the one who gives them faith. They're the ones who have been born of God. They're the ones who Christ has begun a good work in them. Christ is the one who will com complete that work in them. Christ is the one who will present them faultless before his Father's throne. Christ is the one who's everything to them that they need. No matter the circumstances. It was a hymn writer who said, Rejoice, believer in the Lord, who makes your cause his own. The hope that's built upon his word can ne'er be overthrown. Though many foes beset your road and feeble is your arm, your life is hid with Christ and God beyond the reach of harm. Tested, but triumphant. I wonder, will we, will we be triumphant in our lives day by day, being hidden Christ? And not like those who run the Iron Man race and not finish it. Will we be triumphant in all the testing? Our life is hid with Christ in God. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord and our Father in heaven, I do want to thank thee for this church. Father, the last week we saw a church which had so many things to commend it, but yet, Father, it was rebuked and chastised by Christ. And yet, Father, tonight we see a church which was not chastised by thee. It was not rebuked by thee. Father, it was a church that delighted thee, and that was it. It just delighted thee, full stop. And Father, we thank thee for the encouragement that we as a congregation, and we as individuals within this congregation, Lord, that we can delight thee, that we can be that myrrh, that sweet incense that pleases thee. Father, what an encouragement. To that end, Father, I pray that thou wouldst give me grace and give us all grace to see that we are those who ever need to realize our need of Christ. That without Christ, we can do nothing. Not that we can do a little, but we can do nothing. Lord, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Day by day, before we start the day, Lord, we need, as Christ has taught us, if we being evil know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more can we ask and indeed ought to ask our Heavenly Father for the Holy Spirit, and he will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. Help us, Father, to ask. Help us, Father, to be those that surrender to his word, that know his word, that walk in light of his word, that apply not simply some of it, but all of it to your lives. Help us be those, Father, that strive and cry to thee and crave that likeness to Christ in our lives, that love for God and that joy in God and that peace in God and that gentleness and goodness and long-suffering and that meekness and that temperance and that trustworthiness. Father, make us to be those that strive after these things, to be like Christ. Father, help us to be those that desire to have one reputation, and that is that we are for God. As we saw in the Lord's the evening, that we are meek. Our strength is for God. It's not for ourselves. And therefore, Lord, we're not afraid. Lord, we're prudent and we're wise in how we behave. But Lord, that we are for God. Do we ever seek to exalt him by our behavior and by our words? That the people will see him and remember him. Oh, Father, help us to care more about thee than about ourselves and indeed about others. And Father, no matter what persecution ever comes, help us to be those that in our testing are triumphant. Help us to be those, Father, that just simply walk with thee and are faithful to thee. And Father, that we realize that what matters is not the things of this world, but simply Christ himself and the honor of him. 
that any persecution or any trial that comes, Father, it's only for a short time, and it's nothing compared to the heavy weight of glory, which is so wonderful. Help us to live in light of eternity. Lord, make us to be what thou dost want us to be. Be with those that are suffering, Lord. You know them. And I pray, Father, that they will know even comfort through thy word this evening. That Christ, the one who sees, and he's the one who cares. And he's the one who gives this counsel and this comfort. Uphold them and keep them, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. <clears throat>